We did move the session, maybe it, it doesn't entirely, you know. <coughs> maybe there's a bug. There's a bug. Because it's scanning, it doesn't. Yeah. And it doesn't show a session. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. apparently that QR code isn't connected to the session. Yeah. Uh, so you don't have a QR code to scan yeah. Correct. Right. Send a panic request here. You can probably get it from the agenda. Yeah. Well, you can, yeah, you, you can find the agenda, right? Oh, go, go, right, you, right. So it's, yeah. Go to the agenda, yeah. find the session, use the on site tool link. Oh, oh, yeah. Just wanted to let you know that. Yeah. All right. So um, I was just about to start by saying Prachi is laid out with the flu, and you got up in the middle of the night anyway, Prachi. Um, Thank you. Yeah, it's <clears throat> excellent. Uh, so, um, welcome to Tigris at uh, ITF 118. Um, uh, great to see that so many people picked up on the, the change of, of date and time and place, right? So, we, we had a little bit of problem with the scheduling. Several of the co contributors weren't um, able to make the Friday session, so we, we got it moved, which was good. <coughs> um, so, we're, it is shorter, but we really appreciate the help from Roman to get it uh, moved. And we, you know, thanks to the cancellation of another working group, we were actually able to use this slot. So um, uh, let's start by the usual stuff. Note the, the note well, um, especially all of the um, issues and, and sort of um, rules around how we behave towards each other. It's really important that we keep like a, a calm and, and civil tone in order to get uh, the, all of the stuff done that we need to get done in, in working groups. Um, we are um, we're, we're trying to kind of make as efficient use as possible today. And so there's been a couple of um, presentation requests for today, but me and Prachi have decided that due to the discussion on the LISC, list uh, recently about sort of how we actually, well, the, sec the security properties of the, 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 the two, the various channels involved in, in the protocol, we've decided to prioritize um, using the time today to have a discussion about uh, the security properties of the, of the invitation channel. And uh, Ecker has um, provided us with a, offered to provide us with a kind of a, an intro um, to, to the topic. So we're, we're actually going to do that um, slide, a couple of slides first, presentation from uh, Eric, and then we're going to do that discussion. And if there is time, we will do other, other um, business. So um, the agenda is online. Um, and um, basically, um, Ecker, do you think you're oh, good with 15 minutes? Yeah. Oh, all right. Then I'm going to just switch slides while you um, get up here. And let's see here. And I guess some people should like interrupt me or whatever if they oh, think I'm lying or not being accurate or whatever. Right. Um, take it away. I need this. OK. Do you need control or should no, I switch for you? Next slide. I need the mic like this right. so I can't stand. I'll okay. just do this. So. Um, Right, so I think like this is intended to be like the picture of like the uh, of the situation we're facing ourselves in. Um, this is a new uh, this is a new slide, but a new diagram. But it looks like every other diagram we've ever seen before, um, which is um, the setting here. Right, is that the sender um, wants to the sender the receiver want to have this back and forth, but they only can do it mediated through the relay server. And so the um, you know the sender does two things at once. One is it preps the first message in the exchange and it stores that in the relay server in some unspecified way. Um, unspecified as in that's the thing we're trying to specify. Um, and then it sends this invitation message to um, the receiver um, through this to another channel, through an introduction channel. And the premise, of course, of this working group is that the introduction channel is limited, so it can't be used for like back and forth. And maybe you can't like send a big giant message through it. And hence, you need to send like all the major stuff to the relay server. 
So the point of the, inv the um, invitation message is to kick off this exchange of the relay server. Um, and so then like there's this back and forth where like the receiver pulls the message for the takes the introduction invitation message, kind of the relay server pulls the message off, sends this message back, and then um, somehow in some unspecified way the sender learns that the message is available. It reads that message, sends this message back, and the dot 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 means an arbitrary number of round trips back and forth, right? Um, but um, the only thing we really um, so. Um, but um, the, the main purpose of this discussion is this red box, um, this invitation, uh, this introduction channel. Um, next slide. Let's see. Oh. There we so go. just like to be clear, um, here's the other. Uh, here's the diagram with the introduction channel removed. Um, so I just, I just like to put a white box over top where that red box was. Um, and um, so like this is what this is what the main protocol exchange looks like, and the introduction channel like it just kicks off the thing, right? Um, <clears throat> next slide. So. Um, there are two main sort of conceptual settings here. Um, and this is the, the topic of like extensive debate of the, of the mailing list. Um, so um, <clears throat> if we assume that the invitations, which is to say the things that go in the introduction channel are secret, then we have one set of properties. If they assume they are non-secret, we have a different set of properties. So if we assume they are secret, um, the invitations contain, they identify the relay channel. Um, and um, in, in like, the draft that Brad and I wrote, they have explicitly high entropy in the draft. They, um, the original draft, they, I think they have implicitly high entropy. They're like UIDs, it doesn't say they're random, but like we can just write random and the problem will go away. Um, and so if you don't have the invitation, you can't uh, you can't access the appropriate relay channel. So you can talk to the relay server just fine, but like you can't tell what channel you want as there's no way to like actually get part of the exchange. So as long as invitation remains secret, um, only the receiver can access the relay channel. Um, and I think that's ground, I think that's like common ground across everybody. Um, so question becomes, what happens if the invitation is not secret? Next slide. Um, oh, uh, right. Um, I forgot about this slide. Um, so um, uh, there's been a bunch of discussion about these protocols to, um, providing what's called at most one semantics, which, are, which is to say that um, if two agents come in contact with the invitation, they can't both get the credential. Um, so um, this is like designed, I think, both as a correctness property and a security property. The correctness property is if I'm transferring my key to, to Tommy, I don't want Tommy retrieving it twice. Um, and the security property is if Tommy somehow loses the invitation, um, then someone else can't get the key. Um, this is the second property is like weaker, is, is weaker in a way we're going to discuss in a moment. Um, the um, general way that these protocols are trying to enforce this is by ensuring that the first agent to try to connect to the relay channel gets access to the channel and no one else does. Um, and so, um, uh, so that's what I'm calling at most once. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so um, uh, now imagine we have uh, the contrary, we have a, a public invitation where the invitation is, no, is, is available to the attacker, right? Um, so now you have a, a race condition um, where um, the attacker and the legitimate receiver both have access to the invitation. They both try to contact the relay channel. And the winner of the race, um, in the basic, most basic native protocol, it gets the credential, um, and the um, and the receiver. And so, in this case, if the attacker wins the race, they get the credential, and the receiver gets a nope, gets some kind of error, the same kind of error you would have gotten if you'd like clicked on the thing twice on your like on your like your phone. I mean, so like if you know, it's pretty common if you have iMessage, it goes to, like your phone and computer. If you click on it twice, like it's going to work on the phone, and the computer is going to get you an error, right? And so you get the same thing here in the case where the attacker wins the race is an error, right? Um, so the attacker's gonna win, the, if you think that the invitations are in fact public, the attacker's gonna win the race pretty often. Maybe not always, but pretty often, right? Um, like how motivated are you, how motivated is the attacker to steal your car? Um, so, um, so, so like public invitations in the most naive protocol are like bad news. Um, next slide. Um, there's been a bunch of discussion about, um, so as I sort of mentioned, there's been a bunch of discussion about whether we actually should regard this introduction channel as secure. Um, and so um, if people believe that it's not secure, there's a bunch of discussion, and this is more in, um, in draft art Tigris and less in the draft that I worked on, um, of having what, what's been called a second factor. Um, and the idea of the second factor is it's delivered over a separate channel or negotiated over a separate channel, we might say, um, than the introduction channel. And that channel is presumed to be secure in some unspecified fashion. And, the, and I think the way people think you get into this situation would be that that channel is like super low entropy for somehow. And I think I have a slide on this in a minute. Um, um, so what are the examples that might be? Um, a cryptographic key, maybe a pin. Um, um, uh, on the list, you guess mentioned an identity check where basically you would like go to like the hotel front desk and like show ID. Um, and then they would somehow tell the relay server this was the right person to do. Um, um, 
The key important point that I want to emphasize here is that in the protocols we've seen so far, this controls the credential issuance, but not the channel itself. Um, and so the result is the attacker can access the channel just fine. They just don't get the credential. Um, and so can I see the next slide, please? Next. You need the yes. Next. So what I'm talking about, it looks like this. Is This is basically the same diagram as before, but more stuff on it. Um, so as before, the relay, um, uh, um, the relay stores the message, message one, um, sends the invitation message. The attacker somehow captures the invitation message. And I wish I'd kind of drawn that in the diagram, but we'd imagine he steals it. Um, and then he goes and retrieves message one and it starts the protocol exchange, right? Um, at the same time, the receiver receives the message because the channel is like public. And he tries to, re to, to retrieve message one, but he gets a no because the, because the, the attacker is already in. But then the attacker tries to do the protocol exchange um, via the relay server, but he doesn't have the second factor. And so the exchange fails. And so the end game here is neither the attacker nor the receiver get the credential. Um, so um, it's a DOS attack, but it's not, you don't get the credential for the attack. So that's what the second factor does in, in the proposal we've seen so far. Uh, next slide. Um, uh, so, so I think um, every, oh, I think I see your guess in, in, the, um, in, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the queue, that's the word. Right. Um. Do you, do you want to stop for whatever people yeah. want? All right, uh, Yogesh, if you have like a clarifying question, do you want to do that now? Uh, yeah, I actually do have a clarification. If Excellent. you could please go back, I think, a couple of slides to the second factor. Here? Yeah, so the concept of the second factor is not to prevent the second person from getting a credential, but it's after the fact. The idea is that you do get the credential, but that credential is not usable because it is not trusted by the entry point. So I, I'm not trying identity... to see anything. Go ahead. Sorry, did you? So, so the idea of the second factor is not to prevent from getting the credential. You will still complete the transfer. You have a credential, but it just won't be usable when you actually try to use it because there is a flag on it. That needs to be cleared somehow. Well, I'm not sure I see a meaningful distinction between those two, but it seems like the bottom, the bottom, and I can imagine building it both ways. But the bottom line is, as I said, that the attacker doesn't, it can't use the car, can't drive the car, and neither can I, right? Right, right. But the second, the slide after this shows that it's blocked from getting the second messages. That's not accurate. So if you go to, I think, oh, slide oh. number eight, please. Okay. Um, I'm not. Is it, I'm not sure how. How does that matter? No, just for clarity, because that slide okay. number eight shows uh, the okay. transaction is blocked, exchange is blocked, but that's not the idea. Uh, okay. Just a clarification, I guess. Okay. I, I, I saw a couple other people jump in and out of the queue, so I just want to make sure that if, if you wanted to ask clarifying questions or make a clarifying statement, then do that. Otherwise, we can just sort of do the discussion after. Um, Eric is finished. All right, no cue. All right, okay. then we go back to okay. uh, slide nine, I think. Right. Right. Okay. So I think um, I think everything everything I just said, I think modulo uh, uh, you guys' uh, correction um, is pretty much common ground. Um, I do want to talk a little. I'm going to editorialize a little bit in these next two slides. Um, so um, the introduction channels that people seem to have in mind are like email, SMS, iMessage, WhatsApp, NFC, whatever. Um, these have like widely varying security properties, and frankly, the security properties of email are like famously terrible. Um, but in practice, um, I would assert we tend to treat these as they, if they were secure for all kinds of other applications. Um, you know, uh, we do password reset over email. Um, we do two. We do. I know we do. Maybe bad news. We do it. Um, we do two FA over email all the time. We do web PKI certificate issuance over email, by the way. Um, um, and um, so I want to make two points about this. Um, the first is that like. Um, that like uh, this is like common practice, whether they like it or not. Um, and the second second thing is that in many of the situations we're talking about. Um, if you are, uh, if you do control those channels, you can do much, much worse things, even in these same settings, because the credentials that control the the underlying authentication that controls these credentials actually is often tied to like your email address, or your phone number, or whatever. And so, like, in, so the example we talked about, is, for instance, on hotel keys, right? Is I like log into I go to a hotel, and how is like you know, and I like have a Hilton Hilton app, and like how is the the, the room key initially delivered to my phone? It's delivered by something that's controlled by my phone number or my email address. And so if you don't actually trust my email address or my phone number, like I don't know what to do because the bottom line is is like people can just like take over your account, Hilton account and steal, and steal your credential that way. So um, so I think like you know 
like it is like sad that these, these channels are not very good, but like you know the sort of like the they they, they were living we built we built a whole house on this sand, so I'm not sure building more house in the sand is so bad. Um, um, I message, but I message and WhatsApp, of course, are just fine. Um, um, and and NFC is like largely fine. Um, but email isn't that bad. Um, um, next slide. Um, so I, I guess um, this is a little more editorializing. I think we have two main. Um, so so I guess. What I would say is like the situation I described in like slide eight is like pretty bad actually. The situation where even with the second factor, which I don't I quite understand the second factor is supposed to work, but even the second factor where the attacker can easily arrange it so that like nobody gets nobody gets the keys to the car is like actually a pretty bad situation. Um, and we should probably and if we're going to build something like we should probably fix that. Um, and so um, so I think we really have like two main kind of choices. Um, um, and, and as I say, not, none of the protocols extend to fix that problem, right? So I think we have two main choices. One is let us assume that the introduction channel is secure um, in kind of the hand wavy way I just said in the next in the previous slide, like we do all the time anyway, and move forward with that under that understanding. And then it's like we can move forward to protocol selection because like these protocols both behave just fine under the circumstances. Or we should assume that second introduction channel is insecure. And then we have to like really flesh out what the second factor is and what we need to do to bind it to the relay channel so that like if you don't have the second factor, you can't even get into the gate because um uh, and what I mean by and what I mean by that is that um it should be that if we're going to have if we're going to say this introduction channel is insecure, then what we need to do is arrange the second factor is actually required to um, to complete the exchange, and the attacker can't spoil you from getting the key when they're on the second factor because that's not really acceptable state of affairs. And this and and so like this last sentence I want to make clear on we should have the discussion prior to protocol selection because I don't actually know necessarily how to do that. I'm not sure anybody else does either, and so. We need to sort out how that second factor works and how it integrates the rest of the system. And once we do that, we'll much understand much better how to design the rest of the protocol. But we shouldn't design the protocol under the assumption we have some unspecified second factor interaction that we don't understand. Um, so uh, that's my entire my entire case here. I'm going to sit down. All right, I'm going to actually leave. If th this is the last slide, right? Last yeah, slide. it's the last slide with anything except the question mark on it. So I will leave this up. And um, there is a queue. Yeah. Um, Tommy, um, you're up. <laughs> yeah. I just didn't want to do the front of the room, right? Cool. Hey, Tommy Polly Apple. Um, so I have two questions I want to ask. Um, the second one gets more to your questions and options here. Yeah. But uh, so for the first one, because I I've been talking to uh, Yogesh and Dimitri to try to understand some of the difference between the two proposals a bit, I guess. Um, and one of the things I just wanted to clarify, particularly around the protocol uh, that you had drawn up, yeah. um, and this this assumption that we have, just kind of like the just a, a single person can get in, because um, it, it seems like, you know, e even if we have this you know, like questionably secure introduction channel. Uh, the other authors definitely wanted to make sure that like really only one person could get the key and you couldn't end up in a state where you had two parties having the same key. Um, so is, is there in the, the protocol you had specified a, a way that like a misbehaving attacker could so an attacker who's not following the protocol, you know, gr grab, like, look at the location of the secret and then not delete to essentially not do the nope because you had, like, you know, the attacker getting the credential. Could they just try to, like, win the race multiple times and just, like, always get to the mailboxes and observe what's going on, but n never delete so that the other party thinks they have a unique copy of the key? Like, that, that felt like that was one of the distinctions that maybe wasn't being bubbled up yeah. in the conversation. And I guess, yeah, yeah, what are your thoughts? Yeah, that? Yeah, that, and is that yeah. a problem you would want to solve? Yeah. Um, as an interesting suggestion, um, honestly, um, I don't think the design that I put forward actually prevents that at the moment. Um, I think it's pretty straightforward to remove, to, to, to fix. Right, um, right. Dennis Jackson's just or something um, around how to fix that. So I think if okay. you wanted to fix that, I think it's pretty straightforward to fix, but I don't think okay. it's a property that I tend to fix. Great, okay. Because that, that was the impression that like it didn't fix that. I think the other one does by adding some state of like essentially a cookie and that's one way to solve it. But if, okay, let's just, let's just maybe for the purposes of going forward, like assume that that is a solvable, fixable problem. Yeah, I think Some technical mechanism, great. 
Um, so then for this broader question, I mean, I, I kind of like one of just saying like, eh, if you're going to use SMS or email, it is what it is. Shrug. And like, and you'll, you'll notice oh, if sorry. you don't I, get the cube. I, I just want to, I, I, I don't see Brad in the cube. I just want to clarify yeah. that they, they Brad had this cookie suggestion and that would in fact fix the problem. But okay. The other ways to fix the problem too. Great. The cryptographic ways to fix it. Lovely. Lovely. Um, so going to this, I mean, I think we could just say one, if we're okay with SMS just being what it is and it has the properties it has. And if I talk to the other person and they say, I didn't get your car key, then they know they've been attacked. Um, but then we were talking about second factors. I know that the other document is talking about like using the second factor as a delayed thing to like unlock their credential. And it feels like overall, if we zoom out the second factor, factor idea is essentially saying like if we had if one of those factors was actually secure then we should just use that as the bootstrapping introduction channel that was that's not yes right I, and and so it feels like the only reason we would have to is if we have like two potentially insecure like essentially if i have sms and email and i don't really trust either but i want to make it harder for the same attacker to intercept both like maybe my carrier is looking at my sms and my email providers look at my email. I don't. I think it's you know less likely that the the attackers looking at both of them could instead of having a later second factor, we take an approach of like have the protocol define a way to split up the initial secret such that you just like recombine it. Like yeah. you send half the secret SMS, half the secret email. I combine it on the device, and then I assume I'm pretty good. So I, 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 there are a bunch of questions in there. Um, yeah. I think. Let me try to, um, so I think the answer to the second half of the question is probably yes, but it's complicated because of this weird URL um, encoding stuff and how much we want to have the user kind of have to engage with, with the, uh, you know, have, have, I right. mean, you know how annoying is your 2FA, it's basically like doing 2FA, we have to do two different um, exactly. pieces of apparatus. Just make it a 2FA. Right? Um, the, I guess, let me, let me, let me try to steal, man, I think that the second factor version that you're seeing in the, um, that you're seeing, um, in, uh, uh, that you sort of guessed was, was referring to is kind of more in the other draft, um, which is that, the second chan the second factor channel is in some way super limited. I think is 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 the kind of what I took home. So like one of the examples was that like you know you go the second factor in this case is like you show up at the hotel desk and you show them your ID and so there's no digital communication in the second factor at all between you and the hotel desk. Um, and so like I, I type in a pin number then. Oh well, no, you don't get anything, right? You just you just basically say I you know I. Oh, do you, room key for telling me following. You show them your ID and then they push some button and then some of the credentials valid, right? Um, now. Um, that was like how I read like the, um, I guess they did have a one way thing, but you don't necessarily need that. I guess I'm, 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 I will say I'm, I'm stealing in this. I'm skeptical. Of this it seems to me that most of the second factors I can think of have some, have some channel. The only, the one that I think is probably the most plausible that is like somehow, um, really restricted is, um, the one where like, I call you on the phone and I say, Tommy, like I transferred the car key to you, but you're need pin one, two, three, four. Right. And in that case, I can't read a key to you because it's too short. Um, and so I think, right. I guess this is part of why I think we have to actually flesh out what the second factor really means is because it's not yeah. like yeah. there's a bunch of different modalities and some of them, like, I, I agree. If I can transfer a cryptographic key in the second factor, it's like very, very straightforward to everything, right? And if I, because like I've already got 256 bits or whatever. And if I can transfer, you know, 12 bits, the problem is much more complicated. And if I can transfer any bits, it's even more complicated. Right. And so that's why I think if, if we're going to really go down this path, we have to flesh that out. Right. And I, I guess if, if we're willing to, Kind of do the route of like you call me and you give me the four digits we, we could do that as like you know I, I type in the four digits that transforms my mailbox id and then i find it like, well i mean so so uh, this is actually kind of saying wood and i were talking about the problem with that is yeah. that if it's low entropy and the attacker just tries all the possible oh, pins yeah, so now you need like a pake or something it's like i'm not saying it's undoable but i think it's like a lot more complicated fair, um fair. so um yep. Uh, so I think that's, part, uh, or you don't do it cryptographically to some other way. We yeah, now have limited try. I and mean, I again, like, well, I can make some stuff up. I'm just saying, like, it's complicated, and that's why I have to, that's why I have to attack it, right? Um, do you want me to sit down, by the way? You can be wherever you want. Okay. I mean, and Christopher, it, it kind of depends on whether people want to ask questions to, yeah. and or you know, yeah. we just want to. guess we feel discussion. I, I feel go. like Dimitri and Yoga are going to reply to what Tommy was uh, commenting on, so I think they should go first. Okay. Okay. I'm going to sit down, Dimitri. Or Yogesh, either. Thank you. So um, I probably can um, can clarify some moments here. So first off, if we indeed have a perfectly secure channel, then we can just pass the provisioning information uh, through that 
per, uh, perfectly secure channel. And I think that that's one of the option. Um, uh, but when we originally thought of this problem, we decided that we should have a proper balance of security and um, usability. And for, for that reason, we decided that um, there should not be limitation in the uh, channels that can be used in order to pass that introduction information. Um, but understanding the risks, we uh, thought that it could be mitigated by separating the introduction URL, uh, secret, and uh, additional second factor as a pin number. And obviously, mm, the pin number, um, the pin entries, pin retries shall be limited. So let's say um, I call my friend saying them, I just sent you the link and the verification code or pin number for that link is 1234. And when my friend wants to uh, fetch the credential using the provision information uh, from the credential provider, uh, they will be limited um, by number of times, let's say three times um, to redeem that credential um, with the pin provided. And if they enter pin um, three times incorrectly, um, they will not be able to provision it. Basically, that's all there is. Right. Uh, Chris? I wanted to give Yogesh chance as well. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, I think a couple of points here. So I agree with Ecker about the idea that we do trust the channel. Say if I SMS with Tommy all the time, I do trust that that message does go to him. But we also understand that it is potentially insecure. And so we have to consider this from the perspective of the vertical people, say the car makers or whoever that vertical is, right, hotel makers. Uh, if the, that channel was not secure, and if that one message was leaked, we are going to lose something which is valuable. Uh, so that insecure concept comes from that. But yet we don't want to, as Dimitri mentioned, we don't want to prevent people from using the channel that they use all the time anyways. If I SMS Tommy all the time, I should be allowed to do that. Um, and the second thing is with that second factor, uh, no matter how we design, it has to be usable. Even if we encourage people to actually call to give that pin code, they may or may not, right? Um, so, so we have to, I guess, consider that the first channel could be insecure or even if it was say really secure, there could be some attack that gets discovered and the car makers or whoever the vertical is, they need a knob to turn it off that while there is an attack, open attack or while there is a known bug, we don't want to just allow using this key as is. Normally we do, like normally when you get a credential through this, just go and use it, it's very usable. But in some cases when something goes wrong, we do want to knob to put some friction to it. That's the idea. Uh, thank you. Right, uh, Christopher? <clears throat> yeah, um, Chris Wood. Uh... A question about the, I guess, assumed use case here. Um, uh, is there any like latency or performance requirement that like we have to meet uh, with this particular protocol? Like if it took like ten round trips or something uh, in order to exchange the credential, like would that be bad? If, if Yogesh, if you want to answer that, or anybody who wants an opinion on that question, you step in right now. Yeah, I can take that. Uh, no, it's fine. I mean, if the protocol needs 10 round trips over a delayed period, I guess, I think we have mentioned in our example or in our draft that Alice could share over email to Bob while boarding a flight and Bob only sees it after landing. So there is the time. There is no notion of it has to be instantaneous. That okay, would be nice great. to have. Sure, sure. sure. Um, uh, so I guess in that case, um, option one is like, it seems like the clear, obvious candidate here to start with, um, in particular because um, like uh, developing like separate mechanisms to build or to sort of promote what is otherwise an insecure channel to a secure channel to work with the protocol that we designed here that assumes a secure channel uh, can be done separately, I think, um, and uh, would 
greatly sort of simplified the design space here. Like rather than trying to like solve multiple problems with one protocol, why don't we just like split things up? Um, try to solve the the simple problem here with draft for scrolla, which assumes that the introductory channel is secure, and we have a very like elegant way of like uh, transferring the credential onto that assumption. And then separately, um, perhaps here, perhaps elsewhere, I don't. It doesn't really matter. I don't think. Um, work on trying to like fix the introduction channel is not secure problem um, because that that particular like assumption does not seem to be like uh, applicable to all deployment models in particular like if, if you so, some people might think that the introductory channel like using sms or email is insecure some people may disagree with that given what we currently use in practice today um, so the i think the right course of action is to just uh, go with option number one um, and uh, if you actually need to uh, you know, change the assumption about what the introduction channel, uh, what are the security properties of the introduction channel, um, you know, uh, do the work to fix that. Um, so it, Chris, can I ask you a, a control question? Sure. Um, are you, it sounds to me like you're proposing to actually two things that a, we assume, uh, we go with assumption one and also we kind of move the introductory channel out of scope a little bit. I mean, that's what one is. It's like the introduction right. channel is secure. And it, you assume right. that for the, the spec. But not, not only move the, would you also say that we should be moving the sum of the protocol interactions involving the security channel out of scope entirely? Or is it the security properties of the interactory channels that, that's out of scope? Uh, I think like that, op option one is- It you, might you, be a meaningless distinction, right? But in, in my head, option one is we assume certain properties about the introduction channel, how those properties are established is like out of scope. Like it, it could be like uh, over WhatsApp or, or a message or whatever, or like I write down a secret on a piece of paper and I hand it to someone like whatever. The implementation details of that, I, I, would, I would say perhaps are out of scope. But um, I think the, the requirement or the assumptions that you make about the channel should absolutely be in scope because you need them to reason about the security of the rest of the system. All right, that makes it clear for me at least. Yeah. Uh, Eric? Hi, yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, so as from, as probably should be clear from my, uh, my presentation, I think option one is the right answer. Um, I do love a good protocol design problem. And so like, I'm actually, you know, I will not cry if we do option two because it's an interesting problem to attack. But um, but I, I'm not sure like that. I'm not sure like catering to my inner cryptographer is the right thing to do here. Um, the um, I, I guess I think I think I'd like to like maybe just step back for a second and talk about common ground, uh, or, or maybe it should be, I think it should be common ground, which is, <clears throat> um, you know, if you read the charter text, the charter text talks about establishing a secure channel and guaranteeing that only the recipient is able to receive the messages, and um, and so um, I think um, what, what, I, what I would like maybe even uh, so certainly we can talk about like one one versus two, but I think even more important is can we is I think we should be able to agree that. The combination of the introduction channel and the second and the second channel, whatever it is, second matter, whatever it is, um, needs to be sufficient. Um, needs to be specified and needs to be sufficient to guarantee the properties are supposed to be provided in the charter, which is to say that only the appropriate recipient gets the data. And so um, there's been a bunch of talk in the, a bunch of talk previously about like throwing the second the, the second factor out of the out of the system and saying like that's something we're not going to specify. And I just don't think that's appropriate. Um, namely, I think that like our job is to provide this entire entire apparatus and. Um, and 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 so a there's the chart for both charter reasons and also for like just basic protocol security reasons um it is not a sensible situation to have a, to build a system where we're like the property provide is the first person in the door gets the data but like i guess like the the um i, I guess that um the attacker can't complete the connection and neither can the neither can they tend to receive that they're not doing our job if we do that so i think if people think that like that's an acceptable state of affairs to be like the attacker can just like stop you from making the transaction, um, but they can't get it themselves. Like I like them to speak up because I just don't think that's like okay. Eric, uh, Eric Kinnear, Apple. So I was actually coming up to say almost the opposite, which was that the the second part of this and how we bootstrap that that channel um, maybe is is similar to what you're saying. Is that that seems both interesting and and I have other places where I'd like to use that to to do similar kinds of things. Um, so if we could do that, it'd be real nice. But if, yeah, but but again, I I I think hearing what you're saying, I, I can I can come around to the if we need to limit that scope down to, to just the okay, assume that it's it's secure and move on, um, we could do that. But if if we can do number two, we have other places that I think we'd like to use it. 
um, and that would be a, a useful contribution to the rest of the world too. Now, I'll, I'll note that our AD isn't sort of running to the mic, stopping us from from working on that, right? Which which means that it's entirely appropriate for us to slice the problem in two, right, and do both if we can, you know, separate them. Hi, Simon Friedberger, Mozilla. I think I'm in favor of two, uh, specifically because what it says on this slide, which is binding the second factor to the channel, because I think if we want a secure channel, that's something we should do. And of course, what Acro said, it's a nice design problem, but also the, the point that was made in the draft that it should only be usable once isn't captured anywhere else. Right? So that is neither the second, second factor nor the assumption about the initial channel. There's, there's another piece there that I think makes sense to capture. Tommy. Tommy Polly Apple. Um, so I think I, I, I like the approach of one or essentially, you know, focusing on a protocol that satisfies one or, you know, assumes the introductory channel is secure enough or, you know, whatever that means. Um, now, around the second factor stuff, I, I would like to understand a bit more and you know, maybe hear both from Yoga who's next and maybe Ecker as well. Um, what, what we're thinking is okay, like if, if we are splitting up the scope here and just focusing on a draft that has like an assumed secure introduction channel and then you get a credential. Yogesh um, was earlier talking about like the different verticals and one thing that is out of scope here that is just like, you know, what is the content in the body of this credential? Like those are potentially very different things. We're not talking about the actual backing of that. So I don't know, let's imagine that there is some hypothetical car key credential that I have that I own and then I want to give it to Ecker too. But potentially I could imagine a world where in order for me to actually use that digital car key to unlock my car, every time I use it, I also need to, you know, type in, in some new field in my wallet app, like the four digit pin to actually activate it. Like it always requires a second factor just to use the credential. And in that case, when I transfer it, it may also require Ecker to use that second factor pin. So I may need to tell him that thing anyway. So, I guess I'm, what I'm wondering here is when we are defining the credential that is transferred, can we say that, you know, if the vertical wants to require that this credential that they are transferring needs to be unlocked by a second factor, can we consider that somewhat orthogonal from this main mechanism that we'd be specifying in one that you know, they could already require that I use something else to unlock it or have some second factor just to use it that maybe is not really the scope of this particular protocol and is that a state that we would all be happy with or not i mean i'll with no hat on i'll note that we had a spice buff this couple of days ago yeah you know, specifically looking at the issues around security and privacy on, on digital credentials right so you know <laughs> okay see could very well go in there. Yeah. Um, Yogesh. Uh, hi. Uh, so I, I, I think even if we want to go with that option number one, that assuming that channel is secure, uh, that, that uh, is not necessarily true all the time, right? No matter what channel we pick as an example. There could be bugs or breaches or something that is temporary until it gets fixed. So there are, no matter what channel we claim to be secure, can be insecure at some point. So, so at least to me that just saying that introduction channel is secure and move on is not enough. Uh, if I were the vertical, I would want that knob all the time that, sure, you claim your channel is great and secure, but maybe there is a bug discovered and I do want to put a second factor knob on. So, so to me, really that second, or maybe there should be a third option that uh, does say that there is there are 
different comp- aspects to this problem right there is a introduction channel the tigress channel and the optional second factor to me those should three should be split into three different aspects and looked at differently but i don't i i don't believe that we can assume that a channel is secure forever always you guys can i try to clarify what i what i was trying to propose just before um which is is maybe slightly differently phrased from this number one but like assume that the introduction channel is secure enough for what the credential is so like i can imagine my you know the the and th- i think this ends up being isomorphic to the way you're describing it it just allows us to split up the problem differently let's say that my car manufacturer vertical defines two versions of a credential one that requires a pin on entry to actually use the credential as a second factor and one that doesn't that i get to use for free and then separately from this protocol your you know our wallet app on ios can say hey if i'm transferring this over imessage i'm okay to use the one that doesn't require a pin and if i'm sending over sms i'm going to use the one that requires a pin but from the purposes of this protocol the introduction channel is you know secure enough and we get the properties that whoever gets it gets it and there's only one person who gets it at the end of that and that doesn't mean that it is perfectly secure i mean you know obviously there can be attackers there could be bugs there could be other things but let's think of it as secure enough and make the the presence of a second factor orthogonal um from the protocol itself and just be an extra thing that can be added on if that is the nature of the credential itself so if i may respond to that uh, is it okay aram uh, yeah go ahead uh, okay uh, so uh, so that the idea that using a pin or something every time is actually a option because car key is actually deployed vertical but that uh, at least currently it is under users control user has a switch to turn on if they feel that they are driving a really expensive car maybe they need to turn on that second factor for using every key every time that's already a case uh, but this second factor particularly is about that first uh, transfer it right? uh, i transfer a key to tommy and then first time before he uses the key there is a concept of second factor so so a second factor for using it all the time is already a concept in that i think orthogonal and you can turn it on uh, thank you for the time all right dean everyone's so tall around here hi dean sachs from amazon um it it strikes me that so i'm approaching this from an identity centric perspective and it strikes me that we're um maybe not looking at prior art in this space that can help us out Um so I don't want to touch the introduction channel that that's an interesting problem in and of itself um but as far as what we're doing in transferring these credentials really what I'm hearing is we have a delegated authorization pattern and this looks an awful lot like UMA2 um and if you're familiar with UMA um and you can go and I just found the YouTube video of Eve Mailer speaking about this on uh in 2018 at Identiverse um you can um you can use uma2 to delegate authority in so uh, her one of her examples was a car key to delegate the authority to use that car key within a certain um, uh, uh range of time or a window of time uh, for certain purposes etc and there is it seems there's prior art here that may uh, come to bear in this space and allow us to solve these problems or at least look at other ways to solve these problems um I am fundamentally uncomfortable with the way we're talking about it today and using second factors as if there's some magic security thing cuz they're not. Um and we know the problems with second factors. We know the problems with SMS and email, OTPs and all of those second factors and this is why we see the move toward FIDO based credentials now. And so I'd really like us to take a step back and look at this problem holistically and see what prior art exists and see uh how we can use the best practices we have today for second factors that get us away from these terrible second factors that yes SMS is highly usable 
but it's also highly vulnerable to attack and we shouldn't use it for anything that's high value, even if we use it today. Thanks. Uh, Dimitri. Uh, thank you. So um, I do really appreciate the topic that Tommy brought up uh, because in addition to the credential exchange, there is actual credential activation normally. So we um, let's assume the car key example. Two devices uh, having performed the round trip exchange. Um, the receiver device now has a new key, but that key needs to be recognized by the car. So there is obviously a later provisioning part and during that provisioning part, uh, the car needs to um, recognize the key and start using it, even though the key is already on the um, friend's device. And similar uh, co concept uh, is applicable for the hotel key. So the hotel or credential uh, authority, um, what it issues uh, to the sender is provisioning information, let's say a provisioning token, the right to fetch the newly minted credential from the credential provider. So the uh, receiving device will have to make a call to the credential provider and fetch uh, that newly minted credential in exchange for that provisioning uh, token. So, but since uh, we are trying to cover multiple verticals, it's going to be extremely um, complex problem. So that's why we just wanted to bring in scope the transfer itself. And but uh, in the real life, we cannot just um, not to think about the provisioning later. And that's important. That's why we, uh, we kind of we, we tried to bring into the picture the provision piece, at least in our uh, sample implementations. Uh, and the second factor comes into place actually uh, during the provisioning. Both the car might request entering the pin or um, the provision uh, credential uh, authority might ask a uh, user to enter that pin number. And again, if we had a perfectly secure channel, uh, the problem could be solved differently, but that properly secure channel probably would require user authentication. And uh, we actually considered uh, user authentication, uh, maybe with FIDA, maybe with some other uh, instruments. Uh, but that would require bring into the picture and exchange user identities that can be collected and used to breed, uh, to build social graphs, who shared what with whom and how this information can be used. And we decided not to go that path um, intentionally. So that's uh, all that I have to answer to that. And thank you. I'm just going to jump in the queue as an individual. One of the, uh, I'll note that if you look at um, other provisioning protocols for wallets today, like OIDC for VP, they also include like, um, uh, mechanisms for channel binding that are sometimes referred to as pin codes. So it is actually an orthogonal, in that sense, that's an orthogonal aspect of, of, of like binding and it just, note that this is getting pursued in other venues too, right? So it, it, I think it would be a little bit dangerous for, for, for Tigress to produce separate and separate solutions for, for those kinds of bindings. And if we um, proceed down to, or actually work on the so-called second factor, we should really look at how this is, this is done in provisioning flows um, in other venues. Um, but that was my um, personal observation. And, and Ecker, do you want to? Yeah. So I think I, I think I liked Tommy's uh, sort of attempt to rephrase my number one. Um, you know, um, the I think the, re the the important engineering question from our perspective is is as I said, we have this charter item, which is to build a secure a secure relay channel between like A and B, right? And the question at hand is, do we believe that the information in the 
in an Russian channel can be treated securely enough that it can be used to create that channel with no ancillary information. And you know, if you have to like stand on one foot afterwards or enter a pin code or like show you or like you know have a smart card or whatever, not really our problem. As long as we as long as we believe that the Russian channel is good enough to deliver the credential in the way we claim we're going to deliver it, right? Um, <clears throat> and if that's true, then 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 like that we can then we can call it what I called one, or we can call it the way Tommy does it, we're good to go. But if we do not believe that, then we're then we're involved too, right? And so that's the distinction we have to cut. Is <clears throat> do we think that the, that 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 the interaction channel is good enough for to deliver the thing we claim to deliver, which is a secure channel between A and B? Uh, hi, Aaron Perky from Okta, but I'm here as an individual. Um, I am hearing a lot of. Every time we talk about this channel, I hear new ways that it's going to get used in completely different different things that have completely different properties once you actually look at the end goal of it. And I'm a little bit concerned that um, there that we're like so narrowly scoped here on this channel that we're like completely ignoring the rest of the entire space, including other things in the IETF. Like like Dean was saying, there's a lot of other work going on. There's a lot of prior art to draw from. Maybe that prior art doesn't do exactly this, you know, narrowly focused channel delivery thing. But at the end of the day, this is not, that's not a, that's not a goal by itself. The goal is I'm sending a key to somebody, right? Um, and the other, the other, um, the other uh, question I had about about the sending the key problem is I haven't I didn't see anything in the design documents and I haven't heard anybody talk about uh, whether this is a delegation problem or a copying problem. Like, is the goal is the goal that I'm sending an exact copy of the key to somebody? By which I mean the thing that reads the key cannot tell the difference between the two, or is the goal that I'm delegating my access to somebody? where the thing reading that key can tell the difference between the two using it. And that, it turns out, is a very important property that's going to affect how a lot of this other stuff works that I haven't even heard it be mentioned yet. But it has, for the record, it actually was a topic during our um, off forming, uh, um, working group forming process, right? And it didn't seem to make it into any of the documents then. Uh, so. Um, the, right. the charter or the, the design document. Right. The, 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 the intention here is to look at the copy type situation, not necessarily the delegation type situation, right? Uh, oh. <laughs> that was an uh, maybe well, from Ecker. It, right. <laughs> well, I think, if I can. Yes. So, and I see you guessing Dimitri in the queue, so they may want to disagree with me, but as I understand the situation is. This is attempted to, attempted to facilitate like a broad array of existing, um, you know, vertical uh, credential transfer mechanisms of like varying levels of satisfactoriness and various design structures. And so those are like all opaque from the perspective of this design problem, which you may think is terrible. I'm not sure I love either, but like that's the context of this. And so like there's like some opaque blob that has moved around from A to B and B to C, and we have no idea what's in it. And the purpose of this is just to facilitate that transfer. Um, so I'm not saying I love that, but that's the context I think of this design. Um, I guess if I can respond to that, the, it, it seems like this is a lot of dancing around a problem of like, we're trying to send a message to somebody and we have a lot of ways to send messages to people um, as demonstrated by the messaging channels that we're talking about using in the introduction. Like ultimately I can just email a blob of data to somebody and I don't need a protocol to do that other than email. So like this feels to me like we're doing a lot of reinventing of a messaging channel that has no actual purpose of itself other than being a messaging channel of which there are many of those already. And instead what we're actually trying to do is transfer credentials. So you have to look at the other questions and the other problems and the other properties in order to actually solve that problem. So I guess I don't, I, I guess what I'm, I guess what I'm getting at is I don't think that option one of just blaze forward with this path of assuming that our problem is so narrowly scoped that we can ignore the rest of the world is actually a good, plan. So we have um, five minutes uh, left to go. We have a couple of more people in the queue. Dimitri and Yogesh, um, you get to uh, round this off. And then we're going to 
um, do a, just a quick poll to get a feel for the room where we are with respect to the question. And we're going to add like a couple of questions here, just not just the one and the two, but do we actually want to pursue both in some orthogonal way? Or, you know, I have no clue and I don't want to answer the question right now. So um, while, um, uh, while Prach is prepping that, um, yeah, Dimitri Yogesh. Ah, uh, thank you, uh, Liv. Uh, so technically, it's more a delegation problem answering to uh, Aaron's question. But uh, in some cases, the copy, the exact copy of the key can be passed. But in more practical cases, it's a delegation. So I um, delegate my friend to get a new credential, maybe with even limited uh, access rights or somewhat else. Um, uh, in terms of time, in terms of what the facilities can be accessed with those, etc. Um, yeah, that's all. Thank you. Yep. Um, Dimitri. I, okay, I think I'll take my turn since oh, Dimitri. Yeah. Yeah. No worries. Uh, so thank you for that question, Aaron. Yes. Uh, the the. At least I think in draft art Tigris or requirements somewhere we had mentioned that the credential could be an exact copy, it could be a move, or it could be a delegate. The reason it's not specified is because all things are possible. Uh, and as Eker mentioned, it is the opaque blob for the uh, purpose of this channel. And to answer that second question, why can't we just send it over email or whatever, that a blob, right? Uh, we did think about that, if, if that's possible. But the thing is that some of these protocols do need back and forth. For instance, the car key protocol actually involves sending a signing request back and then that signed and sent back. And we cannot expect the user to essentially shepherd that process constantly. You can't send an email back and forth with different messages. So idea was user takes one action, hands it off to a channel that will take care of this data transfer under the hood. And hence, we need that channel. And I guess for these options, I think, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, we, we need to assume that the channel may not be fully secure all the time. That's thank you. All right. Um, Aaron, did you want to make a comment? Because then I'm going to do the poll in many, apparently many stages. Okay. <laughs> um, multi question. I, ju I just want to say that if, like, if this is, in fact, a delegation problem, there's an awful lot of prior art to look at, maybe you might notice my shirt OAuth, um, which is in fact a delegation protocol. Um, so like just taking a step back, I feel like before we can just like rush into making this channel, I think we need to document the existing work and show how it relates to this problem and show how it either does or does not solve certain aspects of what's being requested here. Which brings me to my second point, which is that I keep hearing new information brought up when anybody brings up these questions that does not seem to be written down in the current documents. And that needs to be solved too. So like we need a better description of the problem space because everybody, otherwise everyone keeps talking at past each other, trying to solve different problems because we're not actually starting from the same place. All right, I'm actually close to the queue now. And Simon, if you have something very quick. Very, yeah, very... I just wanted to, I agree with Aaron that I think one is very thin if we are saying there's a secure introduction channel and like you can use it to make a secure channel. And also what other Eric said earlier, uh, it might be nice to have this defined somewhere. How do you, if you just send somebody a link over a semi-secure channel, how do you then on top of that add like a time-based, one-time use thing to get something a little more secure? All right. So... I'm going to do this now. We're going to do like this in many stages because apparently you can't do multi questions anymore. So I'm going to do one for yes or no, thumbs up, thumbs down for option, like treating, agreeing with Ecker on, op on option one here, right? And I'm going to do the same question for option two. And then the third thing for a third question for no, I think we need to go back and rethink the whole thing, right? And for all of these questions, there's a yes and a no and a um, no opinion. All right, so we'll try to do this. All 
All right, letting it run for a few. Sorry, Leif, could you restate that question? So the 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 thing we're the hand the show of hands right now is, do you agree with Ecker's assessment on option one? And then the next question is going to be the same for option two, right? So the this question is, should we move forward treating the introduction channel as secure? Implicitly, yeah, we're we're moving forward with like some version of the currently discussed, discussed protocol with the assumption that the introduction channel is secure. All right, I'm gonna drop it now. It's about 50-50. Uh, a lot of people um, have no opinions. All right, option two, yes or, no, yes or no. And the next question will be, you know, we, we need to do something else entirely. To clarify, is saying option two, does that include the option to uh, a pro split them up as two separate deliverables? So, right, good point. I will do that next. So this option is it's do it alone. option two. Okay, fine. Yes. And the next question will be, let's pursue both, but as orthogonal pro uh, orthogonally. All right. And I'm going to stop it there. Um, both orthogonally. All right. It's getting more support. And the final question will be, you know, let's go back and redesign. We, we're not even, we don't even know what we're doing is the next question. I right, but it is getting a lot of support, <laughs> which is good. Then we know what we're going to clarify on the list. All right, final question: uh, We need to rethink. All right. All right, I think it's stabilizing somewhat, maybe. All right, I'm kidding it now. So we're out of time, thank you very much. Let's continue this on the list. There will be an inter, um, interim meeting uh, between now and Brisbane, definitely, maybe even more than one. See you on, on those announcements. Say, how are we going to respond to the thoughts on the mailing list? Uh, I will, I will send them to the mailing list, and we can. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. This is um, interesting. Yes.